from the studios of Farm Journal Broadcast. This is U.S. Farm Report. Welcome to U.S. Farm Report this weekend. I'm Ty Morgan, and here's what's in store over the next 60 minutes. Interest rates are on the rise. What it means for the markets. Relentless heat and the ring of fire. And even the southeast, with early triple-digit heat, that in fact is a maybe a bit of a warning sign. What this week's weather could mean for the months ahead. We head to the farm of social media sensation New York Farm Girls. Social media can reach millions of people by the touch of a button. How they're changing the perception of dairy farming by opening up their farm. And in John's world, goodbye to a legend. Well, all eyes were on the Federal Reserve this week as it met to decide how best to battle surging inflation. The Fed announcing that it is raising its key interest rate by three quarters of a point. That is the largest hike in nearly three decades. It's also a sign of more large rate increases to come that could raise the risk of a recession. The move will increase its benchmark short-term rate, which impacts many consumer and business loans to a range of 1.5 percent to 1.75 percent. The problem with this one is a 75 point hike still leaves you with very, very negative real interest rates. And it, it's not really providing that much of a break on the economy. It does impact the equity sector, which impacts money flow, which impacts the commodity sector. So that's going to stick around for a while, you think? Yeah, it's going to be an influence for a while. Well, the heat this week is a big concern for not just Americans, but also crops. And in Kansas, it proved to be deadly for thousands of cattle. The Kansas Department of Health and Environment says it knows of at least 2,000 cattle deaths due to the high temperatures, as well as the humidity and virtually no wind. Cattle losses like these are devastating for producers and happen even though they do everything in their power to manage the heat stress in their operations. Experts tell us that heat and humidity can combine to raise the thermal heat index for cattle, creating the perfect storm in the worst way. We'll take a closer look at the high heat and its consequences coming up in our Farm Journal report. Well, it's hoped that this could help out inflation and reduce the cost of shipping goods, including ag, across the oceans. The House easily clearing a bill to overhaul ocean shipping laws with the president signing it this week. The legislation could outlaw ocean carriers from leaving U.S. ports with empty containers, something we've been keeping you updated on this past year. That has impacted U.S. ag exporters. The bill was signed into law by the president on Thursday. You know, one of the strengths of the U.S. agricultural industry is the ability to ship chilled beef and chilled pork weekly and deliver weekly, whether it's to Japan, Korea, China, uh, to Central America, etc. And today, we're not a reliable weekly supplier. Nobody is because of the supply chain issues. The American Farm Bureau Federation applauding the bill, saying some estimates suggest that farmers have lost out on more than $25 billion in ag exports over the past six months due to ocean shipping constraints. Well, equipment manufacturer Caterpillar says it's moving its headquarters to Texas. The longtime Deerfield, Illinois resident saying the move is in the best strategic interest of the company. The company will begin transitioning its headquarters to the city of Irving this year. Well, Smithville Foods has announced it is shutting down all harvest and processing operations in Vernon, California. It says this will happen early next year, and at the same time, it will reduce its sow herd in the western region in Utah. It says it's also exploring what it calls strategic options to exit its farms in Arizona and California. Smithfield processes only company-owned hogs at the facility in Vernon. The company says it will provide customers in California with its farmer John brand and other brands from its existing facilities in the Midwest. It says it's taking these steps due to the escalating cost of doing business in California, tying that to Proposition 12. Well, after a late start to the planting season, the corn crop is in the ground and the soybean crop is nearing the finish line. But the cool, wet conditions this spring have not only slowed planting, but also created some agronomic challenges for farmers. Replant and prevent plant are on the table for some right now. From hail to too much rain and just overall poor stands, some farmers are having to head out into the fields again. Specifically, in states like Indiana, Michigan, and Ohio, planting was pushed into May with the cool, wet conditions, and the window was very narrow, so farmers planted into less than ideal soils, and that created some issues with emergence. 
most of the replants that were in our area in southern Michigan, uh, northwest Ohio, northeast Indiana, all related back to crusting issues um, where they just couldn't get out of the ground. So uh, maybe they did initially germinate, but then just weren't able to get up. So I would say that was a majority of ours. And in some areas, depending on when you planted, how much got planted in that first window, um, you know, some of them, you know, there was a fair amount of replants, you know, maybe 20, 30 percent, maybe other areas, maybe only 10 or 15 percent. But it just really went back to those conditions. But certainly crusting was a big problem. The last planting date for crop insurance is also passed for most crops, even soybeans in the northern states. So farmers are faced with prevent plant decisions as they lose one percent of their coverage a day after those dates. Well, it definitely was not a cool week across many of those areas this week. We saw that extreme heat. So how long does that stick around? We'll check in with our meteorologist next. It's time to sign up for the 2022 United Pork Americas Conference in Orlando, Florida. Register today at unitedporkamericas.com and join us September 7th through the 9th. Time now for a check of weather with meteorologist Matt Yurisovic. Matt, Mother Nature turning up the heat this week. Record-breaking triple-digit temps for many of our viewers, along with some severe storms and even hail. So is this a hint of what we could see later this summer? Yeah, Tynan, we've seen some very active weather uh, over the past couple of weeks. A lot of severe storms. A lot of rain in the east and hot and dry back in the southwest, but now we've seen that hot, dry pattern move to the center of the country. It's going to stick around as we head through this upcoming week. But here's a look at the drought monitor as of last Thursday, where we see still some abnormally dry spots in the east. Uh, a lot of drought still conditions down there for parts of Texas along the Gulf Coast, including the coast of Louisiana. New Mexico, almost the entire state under extreme to exceptional drought conditions. Very dry there. And we're expecting a little bit of rain there as we head through this week. And then still looking at those extremely dry conditions back towards the Pacific Coast and even up into parts of Montana as well. Hopefully we'll get a little bit of rain out in the west, but it looks mostly dry this week with just a few showers along the outskirts of this big high pressure system, which right now centered over some very moist soil there. We're going to be expecting the temperatures to climb into the 90s and triple digits right across some of those areas here highlighted in blue as we head through this week. Still looking dry in the east and the northeast, but again from Texas back to the Pacific Coast and up through the central Rockies. That's where all those drought conditions are and you can see the soil extremely dry. Once we get into the northern Rockies, you see a little bit of blue popping up there and very, very damp across uh, parts of the Pacific Northwest there and interior parts of Washington and Oregon as well. So we've seen a lot of rain and moisture over the past few weeks. It's going to remain unsettled in that part of the, uh, that part of the country as we head through this week. But notice the big ridge building on Monday and it's going to stick around. This isn't going anywhere as we head through Tuesday, Wednesday, even into Thursday, right through the middle part of the week. It stays hot and humid in the east, hot and dry in the southwest with just a few showers coming up here in parts parts of the Rockies, parts of New Mexico. Other than that, only those shower chances right along the Canadian border there, as well as into the east. And the heat's not going anywhere as we head into next weekend. It still looks very hot and humid across the lower 48. So here's a look at Monday. A few showers down in uh, parts of Florida, into the upper Great Lakes there, interior new parts of New England. But then just a few showers back across parts of the Four Corners region. And then we'll see a system dragging a cold front along parts of the upper Upper uh, Plains there, Upper Great Lakes, uh, going to see some of those showers as we head, especially through Wednesday, where that system moves eastward, bringing in some milder temperatures right along uh, the uh, northern part of the Rockies, but staying hot and dry in the west, hot and humid out ahead of those fronts there in the east. And the same thing goes as we head towards Friday. The heat remains on, a lot of sunshine, just a few showers here heading into parts of the Rockies and the northern plains, otherwise mostly dry in the lower 48 and temperatures this week much above average as we're heading through this uh, week and very much below normal with regards to precipitation. We'll have more on this coming up again next week. Time back to you. Thanks, Matt. Well, could the heat have an impact on crop conditions or is it a moot point with the interest rate hikes and concerns about a recession? Well, Bob Utterback and Mark Gold both join me next. 
Find farm equipment on Machinery Pete's June 21st online auction. No reserve, no buyer fees. Start bidding now at auctions.machinerypeat.com. Welcome back to U.S. Farm Report this weekend. Mark Gold, as well as Bob Utterback, joining us. Well, Mark, you know, when you look at, at, at uh, equities, you look at the stock market, I mean, we're officially in a bear market. Are there any concerns that that trend then could bleed it over into commodities? Well, I don't think where it's at now is going to do too much harm. I think certainly the heat is the overwhelming concern out here. And we see that on Thursday's prices going straight up here. And we've got the long weekend coming up. So with the heat and the forecast, you got two weeks of hot and dry weather, 100 degrees in a lot of the southern plains and across the Midwest. So who wants to sell it in here? It would take a real hard sell off in the Dow, something around, you know, five, seven, eight thousand points in order for that to have a major effect right now in the grains. The heat, the heat is the thing right now. The heat is the thing right now. Bob, do you think that that then continues to be a trend or is this something that producers really need to be looking at taking advantage of and selling? Well, I think the end of the month, you have that acreage report will reflect some deterioration of acres it would be down a little. And now this heat is going to lower the yield down to 177, go down to a little lower. So supply is going to reach its tightest uh, expectation, I think, in the next two to three weeks. And so I can see a quite a violent upswing like you saw in 88, 2012, the market, we we're going to the moon. And that's the opportunity as a seller when you want to start really thinking about how are you going to start providing some protection for the long term. But Mark, we're already at these elevated levels. So how much higher could we go considering we are starting from, from this point that we're at now? When you look at inflation, okay. and you got gas prices where I'm paying seven dollars a gallon here in Chicago. Uh, how high is high? I never want to play that game, but certainly we could tack two or three dollars onto the beans, a dollar or two onto the corn without too much trouble, and wait, you know, a couple of bucks out here. Um, you know, we've never had this kind of a long weekend in the middle of June. It's kind of like a Fourth of July holiday here, and that's going to be uh, watched very carefully. If we come in Monday night, it's still hot and dry. You know, we'll be ex we'll, we'll take a big jump and gap open higher would be my guess on Monday night. Well, we talk about this heat, but then as we come in and we do get condition ratings, crop condition ratings next week, Bob, do crop condition ratings matter to the trade? That's always a big debate. And is that something that we're going to be watching closely considering this recent heat? I think anything that reduces the supply side at this time, the market's already phobic about uh, how tight stocks is, the tight farming. I think the basis level is going to stay all as strong into August. Uh, ethanol plants with the crude oil, you know, we're just one event away from a significant bounce up in crude oil. And if crude oil rallies, that rallies everything in the corn market. And then all of a sudden demand basically hits the brick wall and supply is built up. And when you go over the other, that curve on the other side, it's going to be a steep downturn. And it's going to be very much like the 80 through 85 time period. It's, we're not building for a short bear market. We're building for a major long-term bear market, but we still got to make this tie. And I can see the high going for a little longer and a lot longer than I really as a bear one. So this is a time where you've got to be a limited risk seller. You can't be short the board. You've got to be long a put or short cash. It's almost too long to buy a call. So right now as a seller, you just got to keep your pockets, hands out of the market, basically be cautious, but be ready to move because when it does turn, it is going to be a vicious bear market, much like the 83, 85 time period. Mark, do you agree with that? Well, in 83, we came off some pretty good highs. We broke very quickly, 88 in another year, 2008, 2012. Every time we get these highs, we still face supply and demand. And at the higher prices, we're going to bring more production into, into the marketplace. We're going to see less demand and prices are eventually within two years, go back under the cost of production because that's what they've always done. So, you know, uh, how quickly is it going to happen? I think it'll happen quicker than most people think. But the question is between now and let's say September 1st, how high is high? And like I said before, I don't want to play that game because the funds really aren't that long. They're long 250 corn, they're long about 150 beans. They're about even in the wheat. So there's a lot of upside potential if the funds really want to get really engaged in here. And that, you know, if we come in hot and dry this weekend, come, come in 
hot and dry the 4th of July weekend, you know, there's no telling what kind of prices we'll be seeing in the next six to eight weeks. Well, a lot of question about demand and possible demand destruction. And we not only need to talk about demand on the crop side, but also demand on livestock, especially with the economy right now. We're going to take a break and then we'll talk about that later on U.S. Farm Report. Got equipment to sell privately but tired of scams and hassles? Visit MachineRepeat.com and click Sell Mine. MachineRepeat.com, the simple and secure way to buy and sell equipment online. John Phipps took over as host of U.S. Farm Report in 2005. Four years later, the show also welcomed a cowboy poet to the team, Baxter Black. Baxter's humor and poetry quickly became a fan favorite. Baxter died last week at the age of 77. I never actually personally met Baxter Black. I just watched him on U.S. Farm Report. But like many of his fans, I felt like I knew him from his prolific body of work and his remarkable communication gifts. I did precede him once when speaking at a conference and I remember thinking then I was really glad he was performing after me. He could seemingly connect effortlessly with any audience via his humor and authenticity. Even if you weren't a cowboy or from cowboy country, his storytelling skill and genuine love of his work made him hard not to like and impossible to truly mimic. My deepest admiration, however, centers on his prodigious output from poetry to commentary to books and video and of course his gift of humor. Of all the writing I do for U.S. Farm Report, Top Producer, Farm Journal, and Speeches, the hardest, by far, is humor. It's also a young man's game, so to speak, perhaps because the sorrows and regrets we bear accumulate like dust on a tractor windshield, making the funny side a little harder to see every year. But age did not wither Baxter's whimsy, nor weariness shadow his yarns. Baxter's ability to make humor seem natural, even toward the end of a long career, mask what all of us humorists come to learn. To continue to see the lighter side of life, the absurdity of human actions, and the healing power of gently prompted or laughter required a work ethic of dedication and commitment, not to mention an abiding love of the people he talked to and about. His quiet references to his faith reflected a spiritual humility seldom seen today. Baxter was a descendant of great storytellers from Homer to Will Rogers. His memory, like his work, will bring melancholy smiles to thousands. It was an honor for me to have worked with him on U.S. Farm Report, even if from a distance. Welcome back to Tractor Tales, folks. This week, we've got a great family tractor story for you from Illinois. We're going to learn about a Minneapolis Moline U. So this is my grandpa's 1951 U. Um, he sold it when uh, at his auction when he retired farming in 1976. And I started farming in 2003 and wanted to find this tractor. I spent a lot of time looking for it, calling auctioneers all over the country. And one popped up. Uh, just about five, six miles from here, and the serial numbers matched. It had been back of a guy's shed for years. And we weren't sure, just kind of after all the look and couldn't believe it, and went over to look at it, and we found my grandfather's handwriting. He'd actually written all over it before it was restored, and we preserved a few of the spots. But uh, my dad wasn't too keen on buying. He's like, what do you want that old thing for? It's going to be in the way. You know, we got there, and we found grandpa's handwriting. We had the manuals where it had his notes and everything in it. And Dad's like, you got to buy this tractor. I'm like, I know. <laughs> so I bought it and had it restored uh, by a guy down at Moeque, Illinois, and did a good job. It was a little rough when we first got it. It was running, but uh, not much more. And uh, uh, he went, he uh, did a lot of the uh, did all the painting on it and everything and the body work. They were using it to uh, just run an auger. Since Grandpa retired in 76, clear up until 2003, they'd drag it out of the shed, they'd run the auger, and they'd put it back in the shed. So it probably didn't have, you know, a mile on the tires, which are the tires that Grandpa had on it. We had to replace the front ones, but the rear ones are those same 
tires that I remember as a little kid. Wow. Nothing. Just parades and hay rides and uh, you know, tractor rides, stuff like that. I'm tempted to put it on augers, I don't think, so I think it'll just stay in the shed and stay clean. It'll never leave the farm as long as I'm alive. Well, up next, relentless heat and severe weather will break down the ridge of high pressure that is bringing the ring of fire and what impact it could have on agriculture in the months ahead. That's next. U.S. Farm Report is produced and distributed by Farm Journal Broadcast. Welcome back to U.S. Farm Report. Trusted, timely, tradition. Well, this week's weather was brutal. Between the record-breaking heat and severe weather, it may feel like an early start to a long summer. This weekend, we look at the devastating impact the extreme weather is having on agriculture and if it could be a warning sign for what's ahead. Record-breaking heat across the South and Midwest. Unprecedented flooding that shuttered Yellowstone this week. It's all attributed to one thing. This year, 2022, it does appear that we have a rather intense ridge of high pressure. USDA meteorologist Brad Rippey says while the ridge of high pressure is parked over the country, it is shape shifting. Even the southeast with early triple digit heat, that in fact is a maybe a bit of a warning sign. Rippey says while the Corn Belt isn't in key pollination time, it's a different story farther south. That's not going to have a big impact on the national number, but it's a big deal to see temperatures like 102, 103 degrees when corn is silking. That is going to have an impact on that crop. That same ridge is bringing record nighttime temperatures along with strong storms. One of the keys with these strong ridges of high pressure is that around the periphery of these systems, around the west, the north, and the east sides of these ridges, they do tend to be very active in terms of thunderstorm activity. It's often re referred to as a ring of fire. And that's what caused devastating hail in some areas this week. As this ridge shifts westward later this week, that'll take some of the rain with it, and we'll get more of the, the showers and thunderstorms back across the northern plains, the northwest. But farther west, the drought is growing more severe. It's scary to think that we may not be able to do this because we don't have the water to do it. What are the biggest impacts? How would you explain that to somebody outside of Hollister? <sighs> It's limiting the amount of ground that we can farm. It's the amount, it's limiting the amount of the intensity that we can farm. Scientists say it's the worst Western dry spell in 1200 years. And as a result, three quarters of Northern California's farm fields could stay fallow this year. Are we gonna have water in two, three years out of, the, out of our aquifer? Nobody could say that. The drought is also an issue in Western Kansas, but rains recently fell, causing a rare scenario in that area this week. If we have a rain event that increases the humidity in the environment through mud and different things like that, followed by extreme temperatures with the decrease in wind, um, we can see these thermal heat indexes rise to where cattle accumulate heat. Dr. Dan Thompson is a bovine vet who specializes in animal health and welfare. He says the lethal combination was caused by this rare event that turned tragic. But during these bouts of extreme heat, the cattle can't dissipate the heat at night because there's not night cooling. And so this perfect storm hits no different than a tornado hitting a, a cattle feeding facility or a, a derecho or, or whatever. And, and we have these natural disasters. Some estimates point to feed yard losses of 100 to 500 head per location. That's despite the relentless effort by feed yard owners and employees to get the cattle water and comfort. It's something that, that if our people on the ground wouldn't have been doing the job that they're doing, there would have been so much more death loss. Just to the south in Oklahoma, farmers and ranchers have also seen recent rains. Pasture and range conditions have improved uh, significantly in Oklahoma uh, in the past few weeks. But Oklahoma State Livestock Specialist Darrell Peel says the drought story isn't over, as pasture and range conditions nationally are the worst they've ever been for this time of year. Uh, I think we're looking at uh, probably a record level of net cow culling, uh, up around 13% and probably a 3 to 4% decrease in the beef cow herd. 
even if the drought conditions change dramatically from this point on it's almost too late for us to really recover from the loss in forage and and the uh, the amount of cows we've already called this year now Rebbe says while there is no certainty that the ridge will be parked over the corn belt in a month he says since 50 percent of the corn was planted in a two-week period in may and almost two-thirds was planted in three weeks it'll be important to watch how the system plays out all right, when we come back, Bob Utterback and Mark Gold rejoin us for our roundtables. Well, in our first roundtable, we talked a lot about the supply side. And before we move on from that, Bob, real quick, we're going to get this acreage report later this month. There's a lot of estimates out there. But as we saw that incentive to plant and the window opening up in some places in the northern plains, do you think we could see north of a million acres of prevent plant? I think it'll be in that range, but it won't exceed that. I think that prices are high enough. The guys, the planters kept on going. But then I think you'll see a drain on the yield. And so I think USDA is going to have to come eventually off the 177 yield. And uh, that's going to basically make these supply and demand tables tighten. And that's why the weather is going to be so magnified and influenced that from the acreage report to mid-July, that is D-Day and it could be very volatile, but that's what the bear wants to see. You just mainly got to get your head in the game and ready for it because it's going to be, I am in my, I've been around since 1978 and my, Mark has been a little before that. I remember I came out of grad school and coming out of, in, into the markets and county extension agent, and we were just going into what, the Democrats have done in five, six years, we've done it in one year, and then Boker came in, and then we got into the 80-85 time period. I just don't like what I see coming down the way, and I want to get farmers prepared for that type of situation. Mark, we did see some cancellations on exports this week. Do you think we are seeing any hint of demand destruction? And if not, at what price point do you think that could start to happen? You know, 100,000 cancellations doesn't mean anything in these markets, in my opinion. And, you know, have we seen demand destruction? Look at how strong the basis is. We, you know, we don't see it yet. Um, you know, we will get to a price where we're going to ration the available supply. And, you know, the weather is going to get people all crazy. And all I can say is, look, buy yourself a put. You rally the corn a buck, roll the put up, spend 20 cents and roll up another buck. Spend 50 cents on a bean put. If we rally $3, roll that up for another 50 cents or 80 cents to put, lock in that three bucks. What else can you do out here? You don't want to sell grain that might not be there, particularly with these kind of a drought potential out here. So, you know, I think the only way to really manage it is with these puts. They're not cheap, but look at the prices you've got out here. You got 17 to $18 beans. You've got seven and a half dollar corn, roughly prices. You just can't ignore. Bob, real quick. If we do see prices continue to trend higher, what do you think leads this thing? Corn, soybeans, or wheat? I think corn and wheat. But next year, I think bean acres are going to go up, and that's going to keep corn even any stronger to 23. So we really have to be uh, in a put philosophy. I completely agree with Mark. This is not a market where you just want – cash is going to be king until we build supplies. And this thing could take clear into next season before we really have – the bear in control. So the bear has to really manage his risk right now. All right, Mark, on the cattle side, we've seen some culling going on this week. The high heat hit, having an impact on some feed yards out in western Kansas, just devastating. As yeah. we move forward, you have lingering, you know, this, this talk about a recession. Do you think it is supply or do you think it is demand that will be the driver of these cattle markets in the months ahead? You know, we've seen bucks be pretty strong out here. Uh, you know, the rumors are we're losing 100 to 500 head per feedlot out here. That's a lot of cattle. Um, we've seen pretty good demand overall, but the stock market going from 36,000 down to 29 and change uh, certainly doesn't help things. American consumer gets a little bit cautious when he sees his IRA taking a big hit out here. Are they going to buy cattle or are they going to buy something cheaper like chicken? So, you know, I'm a little bit skeptical in the cattle market. We went up, filled one of those gaps that we're up there, we backed off. It doesn't look bad. Uh, slaughter has been strong. So hopefully we'll continue. But if the corn market goes crazy, crazy feeders are certainly gonna take a hit out here. All right, Bob, Mark, thank you both for joining us this weekend. We really appreciate it. Let's take a quick break. And then we have Grit with Grace next. 
Grit with Grace is brought to you by Zoetis. Your dedication runs deep, and it fuels everything Zoetis does. To protect and support cattle and those who care for them, we are Born of the Bond. Learn more at bornofthebond.com. Well, they're reaching the world by teaching about dairy. They're the social media sensation, New York Farm Girls. And this Father's Day weekend, we uncover the story behind New York Farm Girls and why being so visual on social media isn't always full of smiles. For the girls and their dad, it's required a glass full of grit and grace. Good morning, everyone. It's actually- They've become a social media sensation. Hey, girl. How's your morning going? With nearly 645,000 followers on TikTok, the New York farm girls are taking all of social media by storm. Social media can reach millions of people by the touch of a button. So I think it's been really cool that we're able to reach this many eyes in the world to try to share what that dairy farmers are not evil people. New York farm girls consists of three sisters, Evelyn and Claudia Lubner, who are both in their early 20s, and their sister Jojo, who's still in high school and their goal is to simply share life on the farm. I'm pretty much doing herd checks, vaccinations, um, I help with the preg checks on Mondays, pretty much everything cows and some calf stuff, I'm your girl. While all of the girls started on calf feeding duty in elementary school, those farm chores also gave them a taste for what they did and did not want to do. So after I fed calves for that long, I realized it's not really something that I was all too passionate about. After attending the University of Nebraska, Claudia came back with a love for grains. I'm helping with planting season, harvest season, everything in between. And Jojo, well, as a high schooler, she still works on the farm part time. She goes to school during the day, comes home and does calf chores. As sisters, they don't always agree, but social media has actually drawn them closer. Having this relationship together and doing things like this and we've always we've just become a much bigger, stronger bond. And we're really gonna keep holding each other accountable. Like if Claudia is slacking on something or I'm slacking on something, we let each other know and we don't get offended. Anymore. Anymore. <laughs> Bonds that were built despite the harsh reality of social media. Sometimes it's not even the extremists, it's also other farmers or people you know in real life that are the ones that are, you know, sending negative comments to you and you kind of just have to learn to ignore it in the beginning when we started we really took it to heart and it impacted our mental health and kind of almost made us not want to do social media anymore but even then these sisters refused to quit as their motivation was seeing constant social media posts plagued with misinformation it's a huge passion of ours to teach consumers about agriculture we want them to trust us with a variety of skills and personalities the girls no longer focus on reaching those who are anti-dairy Instead, they target what they call the movable middle. These people don't know where their food is coming from. They think it's coming from the grocery store. So we want to be able to target these people and tell them exactly where their milk is coming from that they're buying. And what they're doing. There's no antibiotics in milk. <gasps> is working. I just did a post the other day on Facebook about how there's no antibiotics in milk ever. And it reached almost 500,000 people because of how many people shared that post. Happy Dairy Month. With June Dairy Month, the girls decided to do a series of videos busting dairy myths. Once you kind of go to the source and see how it's actually done, I think you can get a, you can feel a lot better about where your food is coming. While the New York Farm Girls brand has grown, their motivation has stayed the same. We just want to reach as many people as we can, teach people about agriculture. It's just really comes down to that. Each one of the New York farm girls is very visible on social media, but a less familiar face on the farm is one that has been a constant stream of support. My dad is a great teacher, very patient. You need a lot of patience with me. And maybe the reason he's such a great teacher is because farming is what Tim Lubner knew he was meant to do. I never left. <laughs> I just loved it ever since I was a little kid. While Tim was hesitant when the girls first launched into social media. But now I'm, I'm kind of liking it because it's just real life, you know, and people got to see that. Some of that hesitation was rooted in concern. As for a father, his biggest worry is always the safety of his three girls. In years past, they were getting uh, threats constantly. That was kind of scary. He says it has improved as even his addiction to the farm could be turning into a new addiction for social media. I constantly am making little videos here and there and then I'll send it to Claudia or Evelyn and they'll make a video and we'll come up with different ideas, you know, that might work and 
I have mostly good ideas. Tim admits his daughters are strong and independent, even teaching him a thing or two about social media. And maybe that's because of how Tim and his wife raised their girls. Don't ever tell like a kid they can't do something. Like always tell them it's possible, you know. As New York Farm Girls continues to gain followers and fans, these fourth generation farmers are also helping secure a future for their dairy farm. We obviously didn't think that it was going to get this big, but we are so thankful that we're able to reach the amount of people because at the end of the day, it's not really about your follower count or your like count, it's that you are getting that information out there. But closing in on 1 million followers and fans across all sites is the product of hard work that required constant grit and grace. Now, it truly is a family operation. Their dad handles the row crop side, and Evelyn says her aunt is a cow whisperer. She's also an amazing teacher who's taught the girls a lot about animal husbandry and cattle care, and that obviously shows. Well, Farm Journal is also teaming up with New York Farm Girls for a fun giveaway, so make sure you go ahead and follow New York Farm Girls on social media, specifically Instagram, as well as Farm Journal. And in the coming weeks, we'll have details about that fun giveaway. Well, what a fun family. Thank you so much for sharing that story. When we come back, a major business debate when it comes to farm equipment. Customer support is next. Well, the latest flash report from the Association of Equipment Manufacturers shows total farm tractor sales are down 14 percent and combine sales are also down that much. Some of that may be due to supply constraints limiting the number of tractors being built. That plus strong demand is what's sent equipment values racing higher. And that is sparking a question for customer support this week. From Ken Berry in Boston, Kentucky. What advantages, disadvantages are there to leasing farm equipment? This question would prompt considerable details uh, from our financial expert, Paul Niefer. So I'm just going to limit myself to generalities and try to talk about what I know. Leasing is a reasonable alternative to purchasing in some situations. There are many pertinent factors to consider when making this decision. Interest rates, used machinery prices, the tax and financial situation of the buyer or lesser, and her strategic goals. For example, if you want to test a new type of machine but don't know if you're in love with it yet, a three-year walk-away lease where after three years, the term, of the term of the lease, you are not obligated to extend or buy, just turn the machine back in. That might work well. If you don't want any additional debt on your balance sheet, leases accomplish that, but at the cost of no possibility of equity growth. Until Section 179 and bonus depreciation were enacted, depreciation limits came into play more since lease payments are simply expenses for Schedule F and have no limit. Usually, the financial trade-offs are approximately balanced, making it a tough decision, or at least a personal one. In the last few years, however, a remarkable mix of conditions have created a rare opportunity. For example, if you leased a machine two years ago, it probably came with a buyout figure that would allow you to purchase the machine for a fixed amount at the end of the lease. In my experience over the years, this number is always relatively unattractive, and the machine was just returned at the end of the lease. The low interest rates and red-hot used machinery prices have changed this. The value of the machine after the lease is likely higher, even much higher, than anyone imagined when the lease was written. It could be higher than the original retail price. Even if you don't want the machine, you can purchase the lease uh, purchase it after the lease completion for the agreed buyout sum and then turn around and sell it on the used machinery market. And we're finding some machinery bargains and whopping gains being pocketed right now from such leases. While I knew this was mathematically possible, I never imagined I would live to see it happen. The same thing is happening in the car market, by the way. So one answer to the lease versus buy question then is to lease, but do it two years ago. Sellers have noticed this, so going forward, initial retail and buyout and payment will likely be higher. So this door may already be slammed shut. Thanks, John. Well, when we come back, a final goodbye to Baxter Black.
Uncle John Phipps had a beautiful tribute to Baxter Black earlier in the show. Baxter died last week at the age of 77. And this weekend on the show, we want to close out with a final goodbye to Baxter Black. U.S. Farm Report welcomed Baxter Black as a regular commentator on the show in 2009. His ability to connect with an audience and attract a crowd with his humor and poetry was unmatched. Not only did he become a fan favorite on the show, but seeing him speak in person left you in amazement as he'd recite poem after poem from memory, sparking laughter and a roaring applause. Baxter had a gift, and maybe that's why his A Time to Stay, A Time to Go video on the U.S. Farm Report Facebook page has now been viewed more than 770,000 times. I got this ranch from my daddy. He came here after the war. He carved this place out of gristle and blood till every muscle was sore. His words, his humor, his wit. Baxter Black is definitely a legend who will be missed. U.S. Farm Report is produced and distributed by Farm Journal Broadcast.